This meeting is being recorded. So good morning, everyone. My name is Catherine Evans. I'm happy to welcome you to this MP Brunch Connection on the uh, tragically timely topic of Ukraine and Europe. We'll get started shortly, and while people are continuing to go to join, I'll go over a few logistics. Um, in just a few moments, I will invite MP Joyce Murray to say a few words and introduce our guest today, Dr. Eve Tiebergen. Following Dr. Tiebergen's talk, there'll be a time for you to ask questions. And when you do, we ask you to please use the Q&A function of Zoom and not the chat. And you may write your questions at any time during the presentation and during the question period. We'll do our best to get as many of your to as many of your questions as we can, but please note that this event ends at 11 a.m. Now I would invite the Honorable Member of Parliament for Vancouver Quadra, Minister of Fisheries, Oceans, and the Canadian Coast Guard, the Honorable Joyce Murray, to say a few words to you and introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Catherine. As always, really appreciate your stewardship of these events. And uh, thank you to everyone joining us here. Uh, certainly, as Catherine mentioned, it's, uh, it is uh, unfortunately and tragically a, a timely time for this discussion. And I will introduce our guest speaker and his um, uh, connection to matters such as global disruption uh, in a minute that I first wanted to do as I usually do, which is a little bit of an update uh, from my perspective as your member of parliament in Ottawa and just bring you in on some of the, uh, uh, some of the things that have been happening uh, politically for the member of parliament uh, for Vancouver Quadra. So I, First, I'm going to say I, I would love to be in person with you and back at Aphrodite's and I'm hoping that by, um, by the fall we'll all be comfortable with that kind of um, a gathering. I know some of that's already happening, but we decided it was a bit early uh, for the, our group. Um, feel free to weigh in on that and send me an email as to what you think. Uh, so. And before I get into uh, my comments uh, further, I, I do want to acknowledge that I am uh, joining you from Ottawa, which is the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. So one thing that is happening here that people have had a great deal of interest in was the uh, ties into the emergencies act which as you know we uh, invoked that act that was uh, decades old um, but it was timely as we were dealing with uh, illegal blockades that were really infringing on um, pri private citizens and businesses well-being and lives and so what's happening now is as per the act there is an inquiry set has been set up. It's a former Ontario Superior Court judge, uh, Paul Rouleau, who's uh, looking at the, it's actually called a commission, the Emergencies Act Commission, which does an inquiry on how the act was used. And uh, secondly, the uh, parliamentary committee is also uh, looking at the circumstances and the use of the act and the results. So this is all part of the accountability and transparency mechanisms and it's designed to limit the use of the act to where it's really needed and so we'll be seeing um, results from these inquiries I think in February next year. So I'm confident that it's going to confirm that it was necessary to invoke the act and that uh, it was used in the limited way intended. So that's one, one thing going on here. One thing that I am hearing um, as an MP from other MPs, uh, as well as in question period, and I hope that nobody on this call has that suffered from this, and that is the terrible, terrible backlog for passport renewals. So what the minister was telling me the other day is that uh, because of two years of COVID and or two and a half and two years and not 
much travel or travel was uh, um, was drastically curtailed. Many people allowed their passports to expire or almost expire. And then all of a sudden, with opening up of international travel, there's been tenfold increase in passport um, renewal applications. So the ministry has put uh, people on sort of seven days a week. They've taken quite a few measures, but are just not able to keep up with the tenfold increase from the normal. And so I, that's led to terrible lineups and disappointments um, uh, in, in government and in uh, Service Canada. So what I want to say about that is, A, if you know that you're planning to travel in the next three or four months, check your passport, <laughs> make sure it's not expiring soon. If you if it is expiring in the next six months or so, I would suggest that you start uh, looking at at getting it renewed well before you actually have a ticket to travel. And then thirdly, if you're if you have a ticket, you've already purchased your ticket, you know that you're going to need your passport updated. Um, come to our office to see if there is any um, way that we can help you find the fast track for urgent situations. And we'll do that work. We'll do our very best on your behalf. So just wanted to flag that because so many Canadians are running into trouble there. Um, the last thing I thought I would mention because this has uh, occupied me a lot in the last couple of weeks is the uh, commitment that I have to transition away from open net pen salmon aquaculture on the West Coast. And those who have known me since my early days as an MP will know that I convene town halls and other events over the years starting in 2008 uh, to uh, just to make sure that I was understanding what was happening and people had a chance to engage on our, our collective concern on wild salmon and the um, potential, uh, the risks of aquaculture industry to the viability of our salmon. So the previous minister, you probably know, uh, removed the the uh, or it didn't allow permitting repermitting in the discovery island area and um so that was uh, i thought a good step forward unfortunately the courts have have uh, struck down her decision and so i have to um really address that again and i'm busy working on what are the implications and how can we go forward with this transition away from open net pen salmon aquaculture on our coast. But it's become quite a bit more complicated than, than it was a few weeks ago before that court decision. Um, so I am think that, uh, that, that, well, the last thing I'll mention is I did have a chance to uh, put in some measures to further protect our Southern resident killer whales as a minister in terms of our better understanding of where they forage for food and where those critical areas are. And uh, so some uh, targeted uh, protections for those areas during the killer whale foraging uh, um, a part of the season. So that's a good thing to do because we still are uh, we still have a huge uh, concern about the viability of that population, which we want to grow and make more um, resilient. Uh, but unfortunately, the numbers are a little lower than even a few years ago. So lots of work being done on that as well. And on your behalf. So, so that's just a couple of comments of the things that uh, I'm engaged with and, and uh, wanted to chat about and bring you up to speed on. And now I want to leave them as much time as possible for our guest speaker, who is Dr. Eve Tebergen. And uh, I'm so pleased that uh, Dr. Tebergen is, it was able to fit this in. I mean, he is a, is a visiting professor in Paris, uh, where he is teaching a course, a class on, which is called Global Order in the Age of Disruption. So what a perfectly uh, placed uh, background Dr. Tebergen has to help us understand just the elements that have led to this uh, terrible tragedy in, tragedy in Eastern Europe with the, the um, Russian war 
uh, on Ukraine. Uh, Dr. Tibergen is a professor of political science at UBC, and uh, he's also the director of the Institute of Age Asian Research and executor, executive director of the UBC China Council. So it's certainly a lot of international uh, expertise. Um, he's, uh, he leads an international team on the Paris Agreement on Climate Change uh, founded a Vision 20 group about uh, seven years ago, which is a coalition of global scholars and policy makers aiming to provide a long-term perspective on the challenges of global economic and environmental governance. So that's uh, super badly needed it's to bring people uh, together on these matters. And uh, lastly, I'll say that uh, Dr. Tibergen has received one of France's very highest orders, which is called, uh, highest honors, which for his work, and it's the L'Ordre du Mérite, which he received from the, from the French president. And I had the honor and pleasure of uh, j joining him for the reception a few years ago uh, when he was, uh, feted and uh, celebrated at Rideau Hall. So, um, uh, sorry, at the French Embassy. So I really want to thank you, each of you for coming and uh, over to you, Dr. Tibergin. Thank you for being with us. Um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Minister Murray. It's a great honor joining you today. Uh, I'll also start by thanking you regarding the good news uh, of the protection of the orca uh, areas, feeding areas. Uh, I happen to be, uh, in, my, in my spare time, the, the community science uh, well monitoring coordinator for Maine Island uh, in the Southern mm -hmm. Gulf Islands. And we're part mm -hmm. of a whole group uh, with the other islands. Uh, and there's been a lot of sensitivity, particularly about the zone around Saturna, uh, which is one of the protected areas, but it uh, has low enforcement. You know, in general, the data shows only 3% of boats that go through it against the rules are, are apprehended or are pursued. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of interest in the community about this. But I, I noticed the news about, uh, about this new area was welcomed very warmly by the community, including the indigenous community. So thank you. Um, and I should say that my roles with the director, as director of the Institute of Asian Research and with China Council ended uh, three years ago. So now mm -hmm. uh, on the Asia side, my, my main role is Konwakai Chair uh, in Japanese Research and Director of the Japanese Center. But those are the things I did before. Mm -hmm. um, so um, going to return here. So I'll start by acknowledging that I'm uh, meet, reaching you today from uh, the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Hosanich people. Uh, and I thank them for, for hosting us. Uh, I would also like to start by expressing a message of solidarity, shared pain, support, and admiration toward the Ukrainian people and their leadership at a time of extreme suffering and deep injustice under the Russian invasion. We stand with the Ukrainian people I can say that we're also amazed and inspired by the heroic defense, uh, popular reaction, and the talent shown by Ukrainian people under extreme mm -hmm. duress. I would add also, this is a talk I never wanted to have to give. In a way, what's happening is a nightmare. I will share uh, now what I have gathered from my months of research in Europe, uh, attending high-level conversations, as well with Japanese or Indian uh, thinkers and government officials and others as well as findings from some interesting books and sources. But I acknowledge the limits of my understanding. Uh, this is a very hard territory. No one really knows where the speed of events is taking us or how to shape or influence them. Uh, I look forward to learning from the conversation with, uh, with everyone here today. Uh, in general, this is a time of great peril and the potential prelude for more, much worse in the coming years. So it's... Uh, in general, my punchline is it's important to pause, to see the big picture, and to draw upon our human capacity to devise another pathway, and you know, and essentially gather our human in ingenuity and innovation spirit at a time of great uh, danger. Um, I'll make five key points before getting into more details. First, in terms of the war itself, we're currently 
shifting to a war of attrition, uh, which involves great artillery and counter artillery barrages and lots of human suffering. Ukraine needs lots of help to continue its heroic defense. And they have asked for lots of artillery and missile support. And I think they're getting from all kinds of Western allies, including uh, Canada. But the risks of escalation are very high. So the challenge for the West is how to support Ukraine and its people uh, in their defense without triggering nuclear escalation. It's a very delicate moment as uh, currently we collectively, the West, ship bigger and bigger weapons. Second point, in response to the war, the West has come together with unprecedented global economic war and sanction. But the war, uh, the economic war, and the, the, the war itself uh, from uh, the Russia side and the sanctions are shaking the global economy and globalization to the ground. The trust in global markets is being shaken. Uh, and most importantly, uh, the field of international political economy, my field, tells us that we cannot have a global economy with global integration and global technology without tools of global coordination and global cooperation. And the G7 is not enough. The G7 collectively in PPP term is just 40, 37 to 40% of global economy, not like 65 that it used to be 20 years ago, and it's shrinking. Um, and so sh essentially avoiding the G20 or other tools of global coordination and shifting to purely an alliance-based economic management is a high-risk process. And we are going to phase that whole process going forward. Uh, third, in terms of Europe, it has been an astonishing shock. We have seen astonishing unity in response. And now there's a push by uh, the foreign minister of Italy, Draghi, uh, to accelerate the EU integration, which is supported by Germany and France, as well as the move this week by the EU to ban Russian oil imports. Uh, and the EU is the major importer, right? by far the biggest import of oil from Russia, way beyond anyone else. Uh, they're also making, they're about to make a decision by the weekend to ban uh, insurance and shipping through EU nationals, which would affect 95% of all tankers for the insurance side and 60% of tankers for the transport side because they are registered in Greece. So Europe calls this the birth of geopolitical Europe. For the first time the EU is becoming a geopolitical actor. It's also closer to NATO and closer to, to Japan. Um, but with one caveat, uh, relative to the US, the EU is more worried about the impact on the global order. And for example, this week, there is a meeting between President Macron and Prime Minister Modi of India in Paris, partly to discuss how to manage and save the global order from potential uh, fracture, and also how to keep channels of communication and off ramps with Russia. Um, fourth point, Wars in history rarely finish with the absolute defeat of one side. Usually the cost of such a defeat is exorbitant and it's impossible in the case of Russia because of nuclear weapons. So there is immense work to do to find off ramps toward a settlement, even though the short term US priority now is to degrade the Russian military first in order to prevent future attacks. Some expressions uh, and actions by the West can make this harder, finding off ramps and a settlement rather than easier. And we have to be very cognizant of that. And then finally, when it comes to the global order, there is huge collateral damage of this war on the world. Uh, the impact on the rest of the world and the global economy and on poverty and hunger all over the world, especially Africa, South Asia, and even Latin America is immense. Food, fertilizer, and energy markets are fully disrupted. There is inflation coming and risk of stagflation all over the world. It's a huge Pandora box. It's crucial to organize a massive coordinated effort to respond to this. Otherwise, this crisis will generate huge anger in the global south. And that anger will be directed toward the West for not uh, organizing a response to this crisis, to the, the side effects of the crisis. Um, the forces of fragmentation and entropy have been unleashed. We see now North Korea is fully unleashed 
and has just made two long, long distance missile tests and is about to do a new nuclear test. And nobody is able to watch them or rein them in because the order is disrupted. Turkey uh, is unleashed and is now reopening relations with Saudi Arabia, becoming a critical pivotal player in all the Middle East. China is growing more decoupled and more isolated. Many countries are hammered by unrest and bankruptcy. 10 countries are filing for bankruptcy, according to the IMF. That includes Sri Lanka and Pakistan. All this requires a counter push with entrepreneurial efforts, including coalition-based efforts of like-minded countries, but also some genuine global efforts. So this is uh, my punchline. Now I'm going to do uh, a few things. First, I'll say a couple updates that to bring everybody completely up to date on what's happening in the war on the front line and some very interesting uh, things going on. Uh, second, a few uh, thoughts on the causes and uh, the two schools of thoughts um, and updates on Putin. Third, um, talk a bit about Europe. What is the view in Europe and what is this immense change going on in Europe and the EU integration, uh, as well as a few words on Japan. Fourth, I'll talk about the global south and particularly focus on India and South Africa, but also uh, the, the votes at the UN and what it means and what it means for the West. And finally, a few more thoughts on the global order and what we can do and should do. Um, so first, in terms of the war, uh, it did start as a war of conquest and a denial of existence of the identity of Ukraine, something amazingly horrible, right? And that we couldn't expect to see so, so far, you know, in the 21st century. But Ukraine surprised the world with its amazing defense. Now Russia has shifted to a grinding war for territory. Since uh, the shift of that war on April 19 to the east only, the Russian advance has been very limited. They tried to conquer fully three provinces or oblasts, Luhansk, Donetsk, and Kherson, uh, and they wanted to reach this by May 9. And we have, of course, all focused on the tragedy of Mariupol. But in the Donbass, while they tried to advance 200 kilometers in 20 days, they have only advanced 25 kilometers in 28 days. Um, they have shifted to a lower risk, slower artillery based tactic that aims at grinding down defenses and exhausting munitions. Very tough for defenders. They outgun Ukraine, some reports say five to one. That's why Ukraine has been asking desperately the West for artillery support and munitions. This morning, uh, Mykola Bieliskov of the National Institute for Strategic Studies under the president of Ukraine spoke at the Monk School in Toronto. He said that Ukraine's initial success were due to huge Russian mistakes. They brought too few troops, they had too many aims and they were not coordinated. Um, but also due to Ukraine's classic strategic defense by trading space for time, defending Kyiv, not the borders, and then targeting, targeting undefended armor lines. Um, however, he also explained that the war is now based on artillery and drones, and that hence the need for more support to Ukraine. Uh, it starts to look like Finland's battle in World War II, where Russia made huge losses in, in attacking the lines of Finland that were so well entrenched, but eventually did grab some territory. Um, however, one Western intelligence report assesses a high likelihood to the probability that Vladimir Putin's May 9 announcement uh, will confirm that they want to do referendums to occur in mid-May in Donetsk and Luhansk to liberate the Donbass. Uh, and Kharkiv, still remains on Russia's agenda, but it looks like there is strong resistance in Kharkiv. And in fact, Ukraine is doing counterattacks in the north. Um, we also know that half of Russia's entire army uh, is in Ukraine now. That's uh, half of 95 battle groups. Uh, but a lot, I mean, Mariupol's defense is heroic and very, very costly in terms of human loss, but has probably pinned down 13 of the 45 or so of 50 battle groups in Ukraine. So it has helped the East in a way. Um, April 13, the sinking of the Moskva, the biggest ship in the Russian fleet was astonishing. This is the biggest loss of any ship since World War II. Uh, and it looks like we know what's behind it. It was, uh, it was uh, sunk by two uh, missiles shot by Ukraine and produced in Ukraine. But before that, they used Turkish drones to distract the ship. And most importantly, we just learned last night 
that the US provided targeting for the Ukrainian strike that sank the ship. Uh, we also know from EU sources, uh, you know, intelligence sources, um, that there are actually US special forces on the ground in Ukraine, and they help with intelligence gathering and targeting. Um, in terms of uh, the EU report, they thought that uh, everything went wrong for the Russians from the beginning. Uh, first, the US disclosure of troop movements really hurt the Russians. Second, the intervention was very political. So the decisions initially were not made by military people, but by Putin and his close uh, uh, supporters. There was no commander in chief. There were six commanders of six army groups, which led to crazy, you know, to very bad coordination. Um, there was complete miscalculation since they thought Kiev and Ukraine would collapse in 48 hours and they wanted to replace the government, put an oligarch, which has been arrested recently by Ukraine. Um, and once there would be a new government, it would be very hard for the West to react because now you have a sovereign country that refuses Western uh, involvement. Uh, all this failed. Then uh, they moved to plan B, which is shelling cities on a massive scale. Uh, and then now we're plan D, converting the military defeat of the first months and a half into strategic movement toward the east. But the losses by Russian troops have been immense. In the first uh, months and a half, they lost at least 12,000 soldiers dead. By now, it may be close to 20,000. And, um, and the troops injured are probably four times more than that. Tanks destroyed in the first months and a half with 1,200, 250 planes shut down. Um, Etc. So the losses are immense. The problem is that the war is a bit turning into a proxy war now between Russia and the West. This is how Russia depicts it. They don't talk anymore of a special limited operation, but of a struggle for national survival against the West. That narrative plays out in the global South as well and reduces the support of global South for the West in the war. Um, so this is something very important to watch. Finally, there is risk of escalation, and it's something to always keep in mind. We have seen several warnings by Foreign Minister Ivanov, Lavrov, so, sorry, uh, targeting the UK in particular. Um, one source reported that there is great concern that if Ukraine scores too many victories by pushing back the invasion by Russia, um, you know, they could be a threat by Putin that would be much more direct to use nukes and to threaten Kyiv in particular. Uh, Professor Graham Allison at Harvard last week revealed that he had been involved doing nuclear simulation exercises with President Biden, Jake Sullivan, and others in the US administration. And he said in the end, there was no good outcome. It's grim stuff. It's only terrible or more terrible choices. And he said, there is in effect no good response if Russia uses a nuclear strike on Ukraine. Because if there is use of nuclear weapons in response by the US or the West, it would invite retaliation, which most likely would be on Europe. Uh, but eventually, there is no stopping the escalation. Um, and so it's very, very, very difficult. Um, Graham Allison say in the end, the only way to end the war and the killing may be to concede territory in the short term to Russia to get to a settlement. But this would be a chance for a revived uh, Ukraine, more integrated with the West, that would be vibrant, like South Korea facing North Korea. And down the line, 10 years or 20 years, Ukraine could then regain the lost territory. So that's one uh, discussion around the nuclear escalation. Um, everything is moving um, in every part of the, of the theater. So in terms of causes, there are really three levels, systemic, uh, Russian system level, and put in personally. Uh, at the systemic level, this is really, this is the argument of Arjun Chowdhury, my colleague at in Palisai here, a clash between a declining power and the West at the intersection between the two tectonic plates. Um, it's also the ripple effect from the messy dissolution of the Soviet Union in December 1991. It created huge confusion and a power void at the heart of Eurasia. And here I want to uh, cite a couple things that's big, as uh, Brzezinski said, uh, he wrote this in 1997. So big Brzezinski was the national security advisor, President Carter and professor John Hopkins University and a long time sort of uh, top geopolitical thinker in the US, highly respected. 
In 97, he wrote the Grand Chessboard, reviewing the grand battle uh, between the, <laughs> the West and the rest of the world, particularly in Eurasia. And what he said is that in December 1991, when the Soviet Union imploded, essentially, the frontiers of Russia were rolled back to where they were in the Caucasus in the early 1800s, and much more dramatically and painfully in the West in about 1600, soon after the reign of Ivan the Terrible. So basically, Russia took 300, 400 years to expand and swallow you know, Ukraine over 300 years, etc. But suddenly in December 91, in one stroke, they went back to the frontiers of 1600. And he adds this, the loss of the Caucasus revived strategic fears of resurgent Turkish influence. The loss of Central Asia generated a sense of deprivation regarding the enormous energy and mineral resources, as well as anxiety over potential Islamic challenge. And then Ukraine's independence challenged the very essence of Russia's claim to being the divinely endowed standard bearer of a common pan-Slavic identity. Uh, Brzezinski said in this book that there were actually five key geostrategic players in the Eurasia space, France and Germany, Russia, China, and India. And he pointedly excludes the UK, Japan, and Indonesia as being too superficial and too removed from the core. Uh, and then he says there are five key geopolitical pivots, which are the states uh, whose importance is derived from their sensitive location and from the consequences of their vulnerable conditions for the behavior of geostrategic players. And the number one of the geopolitical pivots in Eurasia and in the world, he said, was Ukraine. Uh, the other four, Azerbaijan, South Korea, Turkey, and Iran. Um, and he said, Ukraine is, is a pivot because its very existence as an independent country helps to transform Russia. Without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be a Eurasian empire. Russia without Ukraine can still thrive for imperial status, but mostly Asian imperial state, uh, drawn into conflicts with Central Asia. Um, however, if Moscow regains control over Ukraine and its 52 million people and major resources and Black Sea access, Russia then regains the wherewithal to become a powerful imperial state spanning Europe and Asia. That's why it's this identity question. Uh, in 1997, Brzezinski said a storm would be coming. Ukraine, he predicted, would, would try to enter an axis of security with France, Germany, and Poland, and maybe NATO as early as 2010, and then tensions would arise. And sure enough, this is sort of the scenario we saw in 2014, when Ukraine tried to shift to the West and, and Russia invaded Crimea and the Donbass. Um, so um, he, he also says that the loss of Ukraine in 1991 was geopolitically cat catalytic for Russia because it was Ukraine's action, its declaration of independence uh, and its assistance on, on having just a loose commonwealth of independent states that essentially unraveled the Soviet Union. So Ukraine is at the heart of the unraveling of the Soviet Union. Uh, and stunned Moscow and took Moscow by surprise. Um, and the EU top advisor to foreign minister noted that uh, Putin's super important speech on February 22nd, uh, just as a prelude to the invasion, invasion actually went against, uh, against um, uh, Lenin and Stalin for expanding the borders of Ukraine, giving too much to Ukraine. And then he even went against previous SARS and all this, and he said, we have to go back to where we were in the 19th century. So that we could see how this identity geopolitical question is at the heart of the motivation for Russia. Uh, and it's all within that space. So that's a systemic level explanation. Um, there is also a, a Russian regime explanation. And there was this very interesting Project Syndicate article by Nina Khrushcheva, who is the grand, great granddaughter of Khrushchev, um, April 27. And um, she said that the heart of the problem is the KGB survived through the chaos of Gorbachev and Yeltsin and became the tool for Putin. Putin himself patents uh, his rule after Andropov, who was uh, the very harsh ruler in 81, 84, including the one who was 
in power when there was a very close nuclear war between US and Soviet Union in 1983. Um, and he said Putin initially listened to the so-called Siloviki, people from the KGB, but they were very high ranking advisors like Sechin and Chemizov and delegated functions to them, but increasingly has moved to a more impersonal system of state control uh, with the goal of cleansing the political space of any anti-Kremlin that are now seen as anti-Russian and anti-patriotic opinion and punishing anyone who doesn't show loyalty. And so this has turned to a system of total control or nightmare of repression, propaganda, and nationalism inside Russia. Uh, and so that's, if we focus on that story, in a way, this is the failure of the transition of the Russian state after 1991 that's at the heart of the crisis. And then finally, there's Putin himself. Could this war happen without Putin? We know that his personality is a risk taker, reckless, KGB trained. I saw him uh, from a close up at the G20 in 2013 in St. Petersburg. I must say, I felt very uh, a, a chilly. You know, it, I felt a chill when I saw him in person. Uh, a man of steel with light through his face, has no expression on the face, harsh trained or harshly trained. Now there's rumors that he may even have stomach cancer and Parkinson's disease. Uh, in any case, there's something going on about the character himself. Uh, third, uh, I'll be shorter now, uh, a few points on Europe. Uh, I, I was struck that this war is a lot closer for Europeans than the Yugoslav wars in the 1990s ever were. And they were traumatizing enough. But I think the, the bonds with the Ukrainians reveals how far European integration has gone and how you know, the borders of the EU space have gone right up to Ukraine. Um, according to the top advisor to uh, Borrell, um, who is the foreign minister of the EU, uh, the war is a complete game changer for the EU. The whole approach to norm and law is now turning into an, an approach about around power politics. There has been incredible levels of un unity. Uh, the EU was able to take rapid, swift, efficient sanctions on somewhere ahead of the US uh, and has taken a dramatic U-turn in its history in regards to selling weapons. For the first time, the EU spending military expenditures to a country in war and shipping weapons. Um, also, the EU has been taking the lead in freezing central bank uh, assets, freezing oligarchs, closing the Western airspace to Russia, and now taking the lead in uh, sanctioning oil. And I can get back in Q&A by the numbers, but remember, uh, since the war started, Germany has, uh, has paid $9.5 billion of oil, gas, and coal to Russia. And by comparison, for China, the equivalent number is 6 billion. Uh, for India, is 1 billion. Uh, Italy is, uh, is after Germany, is at 8 billion. So Germany, Italy uh, pay much more than, say, India or China to Russia. So what's fueling the money for the war comes from the EU still. That's why they're taking those actions to ban oil purchased from Russia uh, as early as the end of the year, 2022. Uh, and the good news is there's a lot more imports. The EU imports $80 billion per year of oil versus um, um, uh, only 20 uh, for natural gas. Uh, and so they are trying to take the action on the oil first. Um, Japan, interestingly enough, also had a complete shift with this war. It's the first time that Japan acted extremely fast in coordination with G7 and has just gone through a massive ideational shift uh, and is willing to take actions, sanctions, and very, very strong military action as well. Also, interestingly for Japan, the invasion of Ukraine has had huge momentum effects in accelerating the thinking on defending Taiwan. And Japan is coming out publicly uh, about defending Taiwan if there is a contingency. So this is all the just snowball effects of that war. And by the way, terrible news for China. <laughs> Uh, because the defense of Taiwan is getting organized in a much more organized way. Um, fourth point, some views from the global south. 
Uh, and this uh, point was egged, uh, was, in, was uh, impressed upon me by Pascal Lamy. I had a long discussion with Pascal Lamy, who is the leader of the Paris Peace Forum and the former uh, WTO leader. Uh, and he noted that, uh, you know, currently in the war, the Western narrative on democracy versus autocracies, depending, defending free values and the like, doesn't have much traction with uh, countries in the global south who represent 80% of the world population and of countries, right? Um, on the initial UN resolution of March 2nd, it was astonishing to find that not just China, but also India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, UAE, Mongolia, South Africa, Tanzania, and many others, Vietnam, uh, and many others abstain uh, from, condemning, from condemning Russia. And in April 7, during the UN vote to suspend Russia from the Human Rights Council, um, the only major countries in the South, global South that supported removing Russia was where the Philippines and Turkey. Uh, opposed where Algeria, Bolivia, Central African Republic, China, Congo, Ethiopia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Mali, Vietnam, and those who abstain include all the major countries in the global south, Brazil, Egypt, India, Indonesia, even Iraq, uh, Singapore as well, uh, South Africa, uh, Thailand, uh, and like, and Malaysia. Um, so China was caught flat-footed by what we can call an inconvenient war for it. In fact, the cost for China is immense, right? In terms of energy cost, economic losses, uh, you know, uh, defense of Taiwan by the, by the West, etc. Uh, this is the year when Xi Jinping wanted order and stability for its great party Congress when he's getting his third mandate. Uh, but uh, this is instead he's getting disruption and chaos. Uh, also worth noting is that uh, COVID Omicron dominates the agenda in China right now, not Ukraine, right? And they are trying desperately to stick to a, a very, very harsh version of zero COVID when it's not working, right? Omicron cannot be stopped with zero COVID, but they're doubling down, doubling down, and they have, as we know, locked down Shanghai and created uh, even fears and hunger and all this. So what we find on the Ukraine position and on uh, COVID we find a moment of great rigidity in Chinese governance. Uh, and in a way, a major departure from the Deng Xiaoping line of adjusting to circumstances. Uh, in the face of sweeping disruption, China is not responding with any proactive role or any adjustment. They're only hardening in an ideologically driven approach that does not include any strategic capacity or flexibility of the response to pragmatic changes on the ground. So it's something very unlike uh, the China we have seen in the past, something to watch, but not, not a good sign. However, um, interestingly enough, there are a couple contradictory signals and subtle warnings, and that's very interesting. The most interesting uh, element of the last week was that Xinhua News and all Chinese newspapers, including Remin Rubao, carried an interview with Ukraine's foreign minister Kuleba in which the Ukraine foreign minister was uncensored, unedited, and said bluntly that Russia was the aggressor, was leading a war of invasion and, ingression, and, aggressor, and aggression, and should be stopped. Uh, and if Russia was not stopped, it would attack other countries. Ukraine was only exercising its self-defense and could not accept to be a buffer state between Moscow and Europe. Uh, and this was totally not censored. So this is very interesting. Either it comes from Xi himself or it comes from alternative uh, you know, power holders in China, uh, but it, it goes against the main narrative of you know, ideological uh, purity and, and being on the same side, et cetera. So uh, the French uh, analysis of this is that this is a warning to Russia, a warning not to use nuclear weapons, a warning to stop the war because it's too costly to China as well. It's also uh, important. Doctor, yep. uh, just mentioned that we have quite a few questions that we'd like to get to. So uh, sorry to interrupt, but just wanted to um, give it a bit of time warning. <laughs> right. Um, so one word on India, uh, uh, based on a major source with uh, Menon, the former uh, national security advisor, they said that uh, it's very, very important uh, to see this in a larger context and that India opposes decoupling, opposes the narrative of uh, autocracies versus democracies because it's seen as hypocritical. 
uh, that there were too many cases where the West did not stand behind democracy. Uh, and they, of course, cite the case of Iraq and blah, 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 and the former invasions. Um, uh, and we hear similar things uh, from South Africa, where they say the, the conf conflict should not lead to isolation, undoing of global institutions, and, and we have to talk of uh, unity, um, et cetera. So we find, in general, could talk more afterwards about what we hear from Indonesia, from India, from South Africa. But the main point is we have to watch for this because we cannot envisage a world uh, of values we, we appreciate and institutions without uh, good working relationships with those countries, right? Global South. Uh, so in conclusion on the global order, the main point I wanted to make is we need the G20, we need the UN. Um, we cannot rely just on the G7. Um, and so it's very, very important as Indonesia is going to chair the G20 in the fall uh, to, uh, to hopefully step back from the idea of a boycott. The idea that Putin will actually go is uh, hard to believe, given how sick he is. <laughs> um, there was a very strong argument by uh, Jose Damuri from CSIS Indonesia and Peter Drysdale at ANU that the G20 is too big to fail. And it was time to save the world economy, save the world order by not destroying the institutions that are critical to manage all the consequences of the war. And I'll finish with this. I also will note uh, Colin Bradford at Brookings has written a very, very strong piece, and I know he's in the audience, on why we needed actually a resurgent G20 with a very strong Western presence that would be prepared by the G7 working toward the G20 in order to push back at the global level rather than unravel all global tools of management. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Tibigan, for that uh, very informative and interesting presentation. We're very fortunate to have someone as knowledgeable as you come to, to speak today. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Deniz, and I will be facilitating the question and answer period of today's uh, MP Brunch Connections. Just a reminder that if you have a question, please leave it in the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen. Our first question today comes from Ron, who says, the head of the UN touts the role of quiet diplomacy. Is that a plausible way to end this war? Well, the ending of the war will require intense diplomacy. So that part is certain. Um, because we cannot have an all-out victory like 1945 because of nuclear weapons and the like. Uh, and to get to that point will require indeed quiet diplomacy. Right now, the most effective middle player has been Turkey, the only one that's able to talk to both sides and is still trusted by both sides, which is crazy. Um, and, and so in that sense, I agree with what the UN says, right? Because we cannot let this war spin out of control. The human suffering is too much. Uh, and also uh, the risk of nuclear war is too great. Um, and we have to have, so in that sense, the Western thinking should also have a dual track, right? Bolster Ukraine on one hand, but think long-term on how we get off ramps and, and avoid a complete destruction um, on the other side. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Michael who asks, could you speak about realistic scenarios for relations between Russia and the West after the war? Yeah, that's tough, right? Uh, so, the, okay, so scenario one, uh, the, the better one, uh, you know, something happens to put in his health and all this. Uh, and we are talking of a Russia in a few years uh, without Putin. And then, uh, then there is room because eventually the better scenario is like Germany after World War I and World War II. We don't want to do a scenario like World War I because it was, it was wrongly managed, right? We need a scenario like World War II. So that's what we also hear from Indonesia, from India, from other countries. We cannot uh, have an embittered um, 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 uh, Russia as this huge power uh, uh, sitting on the sideline of everything. We, we need to find a way to, uh, you know, to somehow reintegrate them in the long term, right? It's much easier without Putin. Now, with Putin, is going to be a transition phase, right? Uh, where there's going to be, we're going to be like, yeah, like the Cold War, where there was uh, both lots of defense protection and all this. And on the other side, some 
some discussions, right? Sometime in Poland, in Warsaw, or some uh, detente or some coexistence negotiation. So that track always need to work, but maybe that will be a two-step process, right? Um, and then on Ukraine, the end of the war may force territorial concessions, but that won't be the end point, right? So the, the, what the West should do is bolster Ukraine in the meantime, integrate with the West economically. And when Ukraine is a lot stronger, it may be able to, and, and as future negotiation, a better uh, world in 10, 20 years, may be able to regain what it lost. Mm -hmm. Thank you, it was very, very interesting. Um, the, the next question we have comes from Eva, who asks, what, in your opinion, uh, does the West or is the West doing or should be doing to counter Russia's propaganda? Um, well, so there's two terrains, right? So it's three places in the West and in Ukraine, Russia's propaganda doesn't work, right? Well, a little bit with with some extreme right parties, you know, in, in France, I've seen this in the election, but the people don't buy it, right? So in the end, there was very little purchase of that. Um, the second terrain is with the global south. And here, indeed, there has to be a lot more efforts uh, to, to watch uh, all those because they're ancient friendships, ancient network, and they're very sensitive to post-colonial arguments that become, you know, Russia is put in this post-colonial context as being uh, targeted by the West and blah, blah, blah. So there has to be Positive, but the best way to counter it is to organize a global, uh, you know, G20 and beyond operation to to help countries that are becoming bankrupt because of the war and hunger and and all those things, right? If the West is able to step up, that will really uh, help the you know the narrative from the Western side. And then finally, there's Russia itself, and it's hard, right? Right now, the the regime has hardened to a level that uh, having any uh, penetration for the Western narrative is very hard at the moment. Thank you. Uh, I also, I just want to quickly mention that uh, Minister Murray has turned her camera off. It's just because her internet connection is um, a little unstable. So she still listening and is able to, to jump in with her audio, but her camera will be off for now. Um, Dr. Tebergen, I also wanted to ask if you were, uh, if you're available to stay for, you know, five or 10 minutes after, just because we have sure. quite a few questions to get through. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And I love to learn from the questions. Then. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So our next question comes from Richard, who asks, do some of the EU's initiatives, such as a ban on oil imports, rely on unanimity? And will this be frustrated by Hungary? Yeah, so that's the situation as of yesterday. Uh, but what I hear from the inside is they think they will get to compromise. No, the EU never works the first time. They uh, they go at many rounds, right? They keep going at it until they really exhaust themselves. So I think the expectation is by Sunday, there will be a compromise. And the compromise will be to give big carve out to Hungary. Uh, above all, Hungary will have more time. Uh, like two years or because Hungary is 60% dependent on Russia for oil and 80% for gas. Uh, so it, it is very hard and they don't have, uh, they know they are landlocked and all this. Uh, so that's, I think that's what we see. Also, Hungary clearly is shrewd. And because the EU has a legal action against Hungary on the rule of law thing uh, and other conflicts that they have, uh, they're also bargaining here, right? They, they are holding up the consensus to get space. So maybe the EU will have to give more space to Hungary in the end, but they will get there uh, <laughs> with compromise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, thank you. So the next question comes from uh, Richard who asks, do you, what do you think of the possibility of a partial no-fly zone over the Western part of Ukraine? Um, so until now, no-fly no zone was in a way a, a, a false debate because there were very few planes. Uh, you know, Russia did not use its efforts very much because, for example, Kyiv is so well defended with anti-missile defense that it would have been a, a disaster for the effort. So they, they have not taken control of the skies. 
So the no-fly zone normally is against airplanes. So now, of course, Ukraine is asking for support against missiles that are coming from the air. And for here, uh, it's more anti-missile defense, right? And I think there is effort to provide that. Um, but in a way, that's the debate, right? That's what Ukraine needs. And then also right now, what we hear about is what I was hearing from the Ukrainian advisor to the president this morning is that to help their artillery barrages, they rely on surveillance drones. So those are flying. And so Ukraine is getting resources from the US, UK and beyond uh, on missiles to shoot down those reconnaissance drones. So in that sense, uh, you know, the new no-fly zone was maybe a false debate. Uh, what Ukraine needs is much more targeted and it's uh, based on ground, uh, ground situation, right? So right now it's about drone war to stop the reconna reconnaissance and weaken the ability to do those artillery barrage. Mm. Okay, interesting, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Gary, who asks, what are your views of the impact of Sweden and Finland potentially joining NATO? Yeah, so this is risky. I, I was, I was uh, you know, I had students from, uh, from Finland and Sweden uh, back in Paris, had a long discussion with them. So first of all, they mentioned how much of a stunning reversal it is. You know, for decades, it was unthinkable. Nobody wanted it. And suddenly both the elite and the public supports it. Now the public is divided, right? It's 55, 45 is not a huge overwhelming support, uh, but they feel now that, you know, they felt the danger of being attacked. And so now it has to be managed carefully, especially Finland. Sweden matters less, but Finland has this long border with Russia, uh, like 12, 1300 kilometers. Wow. And it's a bit of a game changer on the ground. It has ground impact, especially forces are deployed by the Americans. Uh, so I think to, to manage the escalation risks, uh, it would be important to do it very uh, carefully. Uh, and I suppose the, uh, you know, the military is aware of that, both the Finnish and the NATO side. Uh, I know they're talking of announcing it in June at the next NATO summit. Uh, the deployment may be deployed over time or it can be delayed, but it's, it's a game changer. Uh, and it's a huge loss for, for Russia, right? You know, basically they, <laughs> they, they failed. Um, not only they failed in, a, in their attack, but they, now they get what they did not want and then bolden and larger and stronger NATO, right? Mm -hmm. I guess we'll, we will see how that unfolds. Um, all right, our, our next question comes from Jennifer. For a brief moment in time, Russia was moving to become a more democratic country. Where did things take a turn? Well, yeah, so the origin of the, pro in fact, uh, <laughs> the, the worm was, the app, was in the apple right from the get-go, right? Because it really started with Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin, which with hindsight, who with hindsight turns out to be a, uh, a very bad, uh, bad leader for, for Russia. Uh, all, the, all the roots of the current crisis go back to the 1990s. Uh, the first one was the fact that the economic policy uh, pursued by Yeltsin proved to be a disaster. They chose uh, wrongly, you know, the big bang uh, liberalization go all, all at once, uh, following actually advice from American economists like uh, Jeffrey Sachs, and that failed completely as Stiglitz has shown, Joe Stiglitz has shown why, because they didn't have the basic institutions in place. They didn't have property rights, they didn't have rule of law. They, and so when you do uh, privatization in that context, it all goes to oligarchs and it also creates chaos and contraction of the economy. So there was huge loss. And so the losses, the chaos, the corruption prepared the people then for wanting a strong man. Uh, to clean up the place. And so that laid the ground for welcoming someone like Putin. And Putin was put in place by Yeltsin in 1998, 1999. Uh, and Yeltsin did it. He was ailing, he was old, he was dying. And, uh, and mostly because he was attacked for corruption. And Putin was the only tough guy who could go after the prosecutors, you know, cornering prosecutors with prostitutes and whatever. And so the, the rot was in the 1990s. Uh, in terms of foreign policy, the inflection point is 96 after Kozirov left and we moved to Primakov. For example, the Russian massive presence in Africa, 
uh, with uh, now with the Wagner uh, militias and all the presence and the shift to an aggressive anti-Western policy started in 96 with Primakov in that when there's new research coming uh, out. Uh, so I think from the get-go, things did not go well during Medvedev, you know, when Putin had to step down and just serve as prime minister, there was a bit of a bit of a lull uh, in 2008, 2009, G20, we, we saw very cooperative Russia. So there was a lull, but uh, essentially the transition from the get-go, both the transition to democracy, transition to market economy, and transition to a relationship with the West, all this failed from the get-go with Russia. It's a lot to analyze back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Adam, who asks, uh, first mentions, thank you for this amazing talk, and, and asks, I'm wondering if you can opine on the impact of the legal responses that have been enacted from the International Court of Justice's order that Russia halt its invasion to the ICC referral to the numerous ad hoc tribunals, commissions, and other measures proposed by Harold Coe and others. Yeah, so that's that's a great debate in uh, in international relations, uh, both in the theory, in the field of international relations theory, and then in practice, right, in legal practice. Uh, in general, there is a debate and a separation between legal scholars on the one hand and IR more realist scholars. Uh, you know, the legal argument is to say we need to build all that regime to prevent war crimes and genocide and all this. And the more we buttress that regime, the more uh, of a dissuasive impact you will have in the future by punishing uh, and by investigating and getting the truth and all this. The realist IR argument on the other side of the divide, uh, for example, one of my former advisors, Stephen Krasner at uh, Stanford, who was later in the Bush administration, uh, his argument was that the ICC and the move to uh, you know, announce prosecution and war, war crimes during the war itself prolongs the war uh, because it escalates uh, you know, the cost for Putin, but that means also he has less and less to lose by continuing because when it stops, uh, everyone will be after him. Um, and so it, it makes it harder in this crisis to have an off-ramp. Uh, but that's that's the frustrating world of international politics, right? To to end a war fast is great, dirty business, right? It's frustrating business. To do the clean way, the legally clean way, etc. Ideally, you want to do like the Americans forty-five against Germany and Japan and have total victory. Then you bring the tribunal and you do whatever you want and you go after justice. But you can't get this anymore with nuclear weapons, uh, and so. I, I, yeah, I don't have the answer. I just see this huge debate. I'm personally as well divided. I, I hate to see the deaths every day. I, my number one thought is how do we stop this war? How do we stop the killing? And, the, and declaring, uh, for example, that Putin is a cr war criminal may not help, it, may actually prolong the war, even though it's morally right to say that. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's tough, very tough. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Tiebergen. Um, we have time for just one last question. Uh, thank you to everyone who submitted their questions. Sorry, we don't have time to get through all of them. Um, the last question is, is for Dr. Tiebergen and Minister Murray. So what is involved in dealing with the trauma experienced by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Ukrainians? Um, regardless of how this ends? And is the Canadian government currently putting any thought into what to do to address what is going to be a huge intergenerational problem? So should Minister Murray speak first? Or should... <laughs> for the Canadian Hi. Side. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for that question. Um, it. Uh, I mean, we're very very aware of the the scale of the tragedy uh, and i think uh, most of the uh, participants in this meeting know that our deputy prime minister is um, has family roots in ukraine and has herself uh, had a very um a core role uh, in ukraine as a as a young woman and then as a journalist and um, and covered Russia in her journalism career for major news media. So we've been um, 
as a cabinet uh, in discussion about how to support Ukraine from the time there was first uh, uh, in intelligence from the United States that this, there was potential conflict here. Uh, one thing that we are doing is we're welcoming Ukrainian refugees. Um, there's well over a million Ukrainian Canadians, so there are many people who are desperate to be able to support family members coming to Canada. Uh, we've uh, already approved more than 26,000 uh, Ukrainians just in the last couple of months. We've put the Ukrainian refugees and uh, applicants uh, to the head of the queue, which is a difficult thing to do because we also have a commitment to resettling and supporting 40,000 people from Afghanistan. But this uh, crisis uh, required uh, us to act and we've been, we've been doing just that. There's um, some over 100,000 uh, applicants and we're just going to continue uh, putting forward support for Ukrainian um, the people who are traumatized by this and are seeking Canadian support. So over to you, Dr. T. Bergen. Thank you. Mr. Murray, uh, I, we, so we can only add that this is a, this is a whole uh, issue for the whole world, uh, particularly uh, you know the front line being Europe, but all countries collectively have to work on this. Yeah, the, we were talking. The UN just said there's seven million displaced people in total, half of whom have crossed out of Ukraine, and uh, you know it's an immense number uh, to support in every way possible. Um, and the trauma is immense, right? And it's, actually, the trauma is the biggest for Ukrainian people, but the whole world is watching. How do you explain our own kids what's happening, right? This is, this is really bad. Uh, and even children everywhere in the world have to somehow learn how, how to condemn this, how to fight this, how to do everything possible, make sure it doesn't happen again. And somehow, yeah, it's, it's really an influx of, of stuff we don't want to see here. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Tebergen and Minister Murray. Um, and, and again, thank you to everyone who submitted their questions. Um, Dr. Tebergen, that was a fantastic presentation. I know I speak for all of us when I say that that was extremely informative and, and we're very grateful. Um, all right, I will, I will pass it along now to Minister Murray uh, for some closing remarks. Well, thank you, uh, Denez, and uh, I too uh, want to appreciate everyone in the audience uh, for attending and all of these very insightful questions, and I was mesmerized by the conversation, so thank you for a broad range of topics that were covered in the questions, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. DeBurgen. Uh, for taking time out of um, what must be a, a crazy, busy uh, period for you with your uh, various responsibilities and connections with people that are right at the core of thinking about the geopolitical situation and how best to uh, how best uh, Canada and other countries can respond at this at this very difficult time. So I, I learned a lot. <laughs> I appreciate very much your, um, your ambassadorship on behalf of Canada. You make uh, Canadians proud. And um, I, again, I want to also acknowledge uh, my team who helps me create these opportunities to have these uh, policy-based discussions. So thank you, Denez, Catherine, Neil, Linda, and Cooper. And thank you to uh, Inessa and Piper here in Ottawa that uh, enabled me to be part of this, even though I'm across the country. So thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. and. And thank you, Dr. T. Bergen. Thank you, Minister Murray. Thank you very much. Great honor.